Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IWA webinar uh, on World Water Day. Uh, our topic today is groundwater protecting tomorrow's resources. Uh, the webinar is organized by uh, the IWA uh, Groundwater Management Specialist Group in collaboration with, um, with the Danish uh, Host Country Committee of the World Water Congress and Exhibition this year, um, represented by the Danish Water and Wastewater Association, Denver, and my own organization, State of Green. The IWA Groundwater Management Specialist Group provides a unique platform to address the technical and institutional issues related to groundwater use, management, and protection on an interdisciplinary basis and at an international level. If you wish to join the IWA Groundwater Specialist Group, you can do that on IWA Connect, and there is a link at the bottom of the screen here. Next slide. Yes. Just a few uh, housekeeping rules uh, before we start. Um, I noticed that this webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA uh, website. And following the webinar, you will be sent a post webinar email with uh, the on demand recording, presentation slides and other information. Um, note that all attendees microphones will be muted uh, and we cannot respond to raise hand. If you uh, wish to uh, provide general requests or have uh, interactions with the other attendees, you can use the chat box. If you uh, have questions for the panelists, please remember to use the Q&A box uh, where uh, we will gather the questions and uh, they will be answers, answered during the discussions later in the webinar. So today we have an agenda where uh, we will look at uh, groundwater uh, as a, a vital resource. We will also take a look at how uh, this resource is um, into play uh, around the world. So we will look at the hidden importance of groundwater in Latin America. Uh, we will look at uh, the importance of groundwater in India, the value of groundwater to Africa, uh, and sustainable production of drinking water based on clean groundwater in Denmark. Then we will have a Q&A panel discussion, uh, and that's why you can use the Q&A box to submit your questions. Uh, and finally, we will look at uh, some of the groundwater activities uh, leading up to and during the World Water Congress and Exhibition in September in Copenhagen. Uh, today, we have the following panelists with us. Um, myself, uh, who is, uh, my name is Tanya Jacobson from State of Green. Uh, then we will have uh, the chair of the IWA Groundwater Management Specialist Group, Stephen Foster, um, who will uh, give the uh, the overall introduction to water, groundwater as an important topic. Then we will look, then we will go to Brazil for uh, Ricardo uh, Hirata from the University of Sao Paulo. After that, uh, Fas Alam from the International Water Management Institute in India uh, will present. And then it will be uh, Julia Gathu from Dr Drilling for Life in uh, Kenya followed by Truls Bjerg from VCS uh, Denmark, the water utility uh, in Denmark. Uh, and then we will have uh, a moderated panel discussion, moderated by Doris Gram from, uh, from Denmark. And finally, the IWA Congress President, Anas Becko, will, uh, will do the closing remarks uh, and look uh, towards the Congress in Copenhagen. What we hope that you will get out of this uh, session that we have here today is uh, an understanding of the emerging practices around designing water reuse treatment schemes uh, comprehend uh, key issues related to sustainable groundwater use, understand how uh, uh, sustainable groundwater management can help achieve SDG 6, uh, understand the benefits of water utilities of inco uh, incorporating groundwater into their water supply mix, and finally, uh, learn the importance of because of the box, um, and then the importance of protecting tomorrow's uh, groundwater resource for future generations. And uh, we invite you because uh, it is uh, World Water Day today, and uh, IWA is proud to support the official UN uh, water uh, that campaign. Uh, so we invite you to share your groundwater story with us. Uh, tag uh, IWA HQ and UN Water on your social media uh, platforms and tell us how uh, groundwater affects your life. Is there enough? Is it safe? What needs uh, to be done to protect the groundwater? Um, yeah, so please use this. And without uh, further ado, I think I will give the, the floor to uh, 
Stephen Foster, uh, who will give you an overview of groundwater as a vital resource. Uh, thank you, Tanya, for your very uh, helpful introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to overview uh, groundwater uh, as chair of the uh, IWA Groundwater Management Specialist Group. And three other members of the group will be presenting more detail from their regions uh, after I've finished. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, um, groundwater resources are uh, of wide relevance globally to beyond drinking water supply, to food production, industrial production, and also to ecosystems. And you've got to get a balanced picture of current use before you can start getting into the uh, management um, scene. Most importantly, in many countries, it provides a major component of, of irrigation water, much appreciated by farmers, but generally poorly managed. And very often, the lack of management of irrigation, uh, groundwater use for irrigation, it puts it into direct conflict with its use for public supply. Aqua discharge is essential to the sustainability of many aqua, aqua, aquatic ecosystems globally. And it's also, and our main focus today, a critical resource for low cost uh, drinking water, which is usually of high quality, both in urban and rural settings. And generally here today, most of our focus will be on urban water supply. Next slide, please. Yeah, and I'm going to just give you some uh, data on that. Um, very important uh, for economical water supply provision, generally being the lowest uh, uh, cost source to innumerable cities and towns worldwide. Somewhere approaching 50% of the global population are, are, are today um, estimated estimated to be uh, supplied by water wells and springs. And the better data on use comes from the EU and the US where respectively 310 million and 105 million people are, are, are using groundwater for their, for their supply. The large natural storage of aqua systems, and this is the first message, means that groundwater is likely to be even more important in drinking water supply under climate change adaptation because the storage is there to be used. Next slide, please. Now, groundwater and urbanization has a very um, direct relationship, but it's, it's invisible and, uh, and as a result, often presents some difficulties to management. One has to understand the um, ways in which groundwater is extracted within urban areas and outside urban areas, the relationship to surface water use, and then what happens to wastewater uh, and, uh, and liquid effluents. It, our city is mainly served by in-situ sanitation, which is a possible uh, source of pollution, or are they mainly served with sewerage? In which case, where is the wastewater going to? What is the level of treatment? And how is that affecting aquifers downstream? Uh, next slide, please. So looking at these interactions um, of urbanization on groundwater, there's increased recharge very often, nearly always, despite land surface impermeabilization. Why? Because of mains water leakage, because of wastewater disposal, and so on. But this comes at a price, the price of significant quality degradation, particularly in shallow aquifers. In reverse, groundwater use and urbanization can cause infrastructure damage if it's excessive and there's land subsidence. And Later in the typical urban cycle, when water uh, tables in urban areas often tend to rebound, it can, there can be damage due to inundation and to uplift problems. Next slide, please. So if I now look at some of the main management challenges, well, within municipal limits, there's really sufficient groundwater resources to, to support the total urban water utility requirement. Thus, sustainability issues arise. And nor the normal solution to this is to develop protected well fields external uh, to the cities. And this can be sustainable if the uh, land area that they, uh, that they capture their recharge from is protected. Um, there's more severe challenges I mentioned before of ac from aqua systems simultaneously exploited for water well irrigation, which is the major consumer of groundwater. Now, in many developing cities, and we'll hear more from this from Ricardo and Faiz, 
private self-supply from groundwater, that's nothing to do with utilities, is a major phenomenon. Um, and it greatly improves water access for some water groups, but it comes, this comes at a price. And rapid um, uncontrolled urbanization places groundwater under increasing risk of pollution. Um, and there are growing concerns over water quality and potential impacts on human health in numerous cities. Next slide, please. So this is this uh, groundwater in the city is an evolving relationship. Starts out in, as in my upper picture here. There's a fairly simple uh, cone of depression under the city, and most of the wells in the city normally evolves to external well fields providing the city, and some. Uh, leakage and more discharge to the ground with a rising water table in the urban area, which finally um, can result in problems for the infrastructure. And here in the pictures I've shown a serious subsidence from a Mexican city and uh, inundation as a result of water table uh, rebound in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Next slide, please. So groundwater, urban groundwater management is a very important issue. It's groundwater is more significant in overall water supply and often appreciated generally, and there's often this invisible link between various facets of urban infrastructure. So urban groundwater needs to be proactively managed and anything less can be costly and, 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 and indeed hazardous. But gra urban groundwater too often is, not, is often the responsibility of no, nobody in particular, and better stakeholder engagement is essential. Um, we need the regulatory agency to take a lead, but we need water, water utilities more involved. And in the end, in the long run, in most situations, the development of conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water resources is highly, highly recommended, um, but sometimes faces institutional problems in getting it uh, uh, organized. Next slide, please. Um, very often we, we find in, my, in this diagram, the diagram, the spontaneous diagram, the conjunctive use, they take water from the river in the city, there are lots of wells and they discharge here. This is not a particularly attractive long term option, but it's what tends to arise at the beginning. The better planned situation is where the number of wells within urban uh, limits reduces and their types of use uh, uh, reduce. External well fields are drilled by water utilities that are protected and supply the city from outside. And the wastewater from cities is guided to areas where it's first treated and then used maybe for irrigation. Um, and this, uh, these areas uh, are not um, allowed to impact uh, uh, potable water supplies. Next slide, please. I'm going to give now a couple of examples of very positive management uh, from developing countries of groundwater in urban areas. Um, it's a long story, the Bangkok story, it started back um, in the mid 80s when the water table was falling very quickly um, to about minus seven in, th in the deeper aquifers, these deeper aquifers here, to about minus 60, minus 70 uh, below sea level, land substance was increasing and there were uh, great fears that this would increase the risk of flooding from the sea um, because more and more land was, was falling below sea level as a result of groundwater abstraction. The first action they took was to ban water well construction and close some existing sources. But until they provide the alternative sources of municipal water supply were provided and metering and progressive charging of for groundwater use was implemented, they did not succeed in stabilizing and getting an element of recovery of the water table and stabilizing land subsidence. But now this problem is largely solved as a result of a coordinated effort led by a regulatory agency, the groundwater department of, the, of, 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 the, of Thailand, uh, but greatly supported by the various utilities that provide water for Greater Bangkok. Next slide, please. Lima is another example, uh, in, uh, very different to Bangkok, but also very positive from the point of view of management. This was the uh, trajectory of the falling water table. Um, uh, in the uh, through the 1960s and 1970s, um, uh, which uh, was caused partly by municipal water supply abstraction, partly by private abstraction, and uh, partly by lack of integration of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the two main sources, the River Remac and the, and the, and the well fields. 
the aqua was fairly thin and there was concern in an arid area like Peru, and it's a very arid area, the, the, the aquifer would be completely dewatered and not available for the future. So the government gave the water utility, uh, Sedapal is the name of that utility, uh, the responsibility of setting up a special department and taking various actions to improve the situation. First, they um, improved the artificial recharge from the REMAC by doing works in its, in its course. Second, they connected all the main districts of the city so that people could be provided either by treated surface water when that water was available and treatable or by groundwater. And thirdly, they, they instigated uh, more charging and closure of wells in the worst areas. And this is the result. Within about a 10 year period, they achieved stability and minor increases um, at a reasonable groundwater extraction and the aquifer has been saved for tomorrow's use. Next slide, please. This uh, private self supply from groundwater is often a forgotten policy dimension. In many uh, South Asian and Latin American cities, it's a major issue. It starts as a coping strategy. People find that they're not getting a good supply, a reliable supply from the water utility. Um, and in some ways it reduces, reduces demand on the utility and recovers mains leakage, but it distorts water utility operations and has major, major implications for their finance and future investment. You can't ban this practice. It's just unrealistic and impractical unless the risks are very serious. But management is most certainly needed, and we'll hear more of that from um, Faiz and Ricardo uh, when they speak. Next slide, please. I just got one example from Brazil where there are over 9,000, uh, probably in the order of 14 to 15,000 water wells, private water wells, capable of providing 40% of the utility water supply. Most multi residential buildings, all these high blocks of apartments, have high yielding tube wells and they use the, these tube wells to substitute for utility water once they've used the social tariff. But this may great difficulty for the Fortaleza water utility um, in collecting charges for, to, to, um, to maintain the sewage network. And in the, in, and in the end, this utility got involved with uh, undertaking inventory and making charges to the users in this respect which helped to uh, balance these two forms of groundwater use in the urban area. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. um, a big issue in, in urban areas are groundwater pollution threats from wastewater, from industrial chemi chemical spillage, ground disposal, and even solid waste landfill in some cases. This in, the impact varies widely with the vulnerability of groundwater systems. It's by no means a, a straightforward issue. And deeper aquifers, are not nearly as prone to pollution as shallow ones. But in-situ sanitation in particular at high density often results in excessive nit nitrate or nitrogen load, and sometimes in, in um, microbiological pollution and must be re regarded as incompatible with the use of shallow aquifers for drinking water supply in many situations. Uh, next slide, please. An example here from Natal in Brazil where uh, this is the southern side of Natal city, which bridges the Rio Potengi. And all of this area is now heavily polluted with nitrates as a result of in situ sanitation. And the water utility has abandoned its use and tended to take its groundwater from uh, less densely populated areas. Next slide, please. If uh, main sewerage is a significant issue in the city, but there is not adequate treatment, you often see irrigation of downstream alluvial areas right, uh, with wastewater right up to wellheads, which is a serious malpractice and should not be allowed. Um, and you can see here that good quality groundwater usually falls in this range, but in these cities, and this is um, downstream of Mexico City, Leon in Mexico, Hatiai in Thailand, and uh, the uh, downstream uh, of, the, of the Jordanian capital, there are serious groundwater pollution put, pollution issues as a result of uncontrolled uh, use of wastewater for irrigation close to wellheads. Next slide, please. So to develop this integrated vision, uh, we need to see the picture from both sides, in fact, from all sides, to make the invisible visible. 
Uh, and this is a, a big challenge. You need groundwater specialists and you need to involve a lot of stakeholders to do that. Next slide, please. So I'll leave it there. We can pick up these management issues in more detail in the, um, in, in the discussion. And I say thank you for attending and hand over um, back to Tanya for the presentations from the rest of the uh, groundwater management specialist group. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that uh, very uh, well presented presentation. Um, next up is Ricardo Hirata from the uh, University of Sao Paulo on the hidden importance of groundwater in Latin America. Uh, and uh, Ricardo, please remember to turn on your uh, camera. Oh, yes, I think it's on. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Tanya, and uh, thank you for the introductions, Stephen, for uh, give us this very comprehensive view of the groundwater importance and problems and some solutions. And also, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and giving the possibility to talk about uh, the importance of groundwater in, in Latin America. Next, Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, well, unquestionably, uh, groundwater is crucial for the region and um, although uh, there are some problems uh, of overexploitation and contamination. Uh, normally, these problems in our region are still localized, mainly in big cities or in more industrialized areas. And, and, and groundwater uh, resources is still unexploited, considered the total amount of water that is still available for us. But uh, we don't know exactly how important the groundwater uh, is uh, for the countries in Latin America um, because we don't have uh, reliable data about groundwater or even good studies to demonstrate this. Uh, in a not so recent study involving some leading hydrogeologists in the region, we ask about the number of wells, the production and importance of groundwater for the country the, their countries and the use of groundwater in general. And it's interesting because the answer was something like 70% to 90% of the wells are illegal or even clandestine. It means that there are no wells. Uh, with such a high irregularity, uh, I think it's impossible to understand the importance of this resource or, or even uh, uh, have an adequate uh, management. Uh, next slide, please. I think a good example about this irregularity uh, is in the city of São José do Rio Preto in Brazil, the interior of my state of Sao Paulo. Um, it's a city of uh, half a million people. It's a medium to size city and uh, it's supplied by municipal wells uh, and also from uh, water from surface, water from Ribeirão uh, Preto River, or sorry, Preto River. And uh, in this map, you, you can see the green dots are the municipal wells and the blue dots are uh, the regular private wells. And all these dots are, uh, are regular. It means that these wells uh, have uh, operational license. Next slide, please. But this is uh, the reality, actually. Uh, there are 83 more uh, private wells that supply uh, the, the public system. And uh, we are take, uh, talking about uh, well-constructed uh, well wells of 120, 150 meters depth uh, that generally supply condominiums industries and many other services. Um, next slide, please. Well, there are some countries with a little more control, uh, like Mexico, or part of Mexico, Chile, and uh, Costa Rica. Or even in some countries, there are some regions that the governments or more local government can control the groundwater, but this is a little bit more rare than common. Interestingly, uh, in virtual all country, and uh, there are laws that uh, are considered good 
and modern and uh, where the um, command and control mechanism is still uh, uh, a central piece. But the governments are not prepared to apply it. That is general, uh, uh, normally that happens in, in many other, in, in, in the countries in the, the, the region. There is no uh, control or even there isn't a structure for good uh, compliance or even political will to do so. Next slide. I wanted to give uh, an example about the metropolitan region of Recife that is located in the northeast of the country. Nice place, very touristic. And, uh, and the Recife is a very good example of this hiding, uh, hiding importance of groundwater. Uh, we are speaking about the metropolitan area of almost 4 million people. 9% of this region, this metropolitan region, is uh, its sub, uh, water supply, uh, the water supplies come from the rivers and dams. However, Recife has uh, 14,000 private wells that add another 2 cubic meters per second. That's a lot of water, actually. So instead of 13%, uh, groundwater is responsible for much more, actually 34%. During the droughts and problems of uh, surface water, this number increases fantastically, more than 50% sometimes. And if uh, those wells do not exist, actually the system would collapse. Ah, that's a, an important number. 80% of these wells are irregular. Next slide, please. Well, due to intense exploitation, the uh, cost of the groundwater has increased twice. It means that you have a lower uh, water uh, potential magic level. It, it, of course, increased the cost of the water. It means from the natural situation and today, the price, increase, the price of the water increased twice. But the people don't abandon these wells because the cost of the groundwater is still 50% cheaper than the water from the public uh, system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but this intense groundwater extraction concentrates mainly in two regions that in the map in the right side is in, in red. Um, this very intense ex exploitation uh, creates risk to aquifer uh, that uh, also is a very old water. Uh, next slide, please. In some places, we can find the water with more than 20,000 years. It's a very confined system. It's a shallow system, but it's very confined. It's very particular for the coast of Brazil. And, uh, but the potential, potential metric level of this confined Cabo, uh, the Cretaceous aquifer that is below the city of Recife, now the potential metric level is 90 meters below the sea level with uh, a risk of a saline intrusion through the aquifer. Next slide, please. Well, consider current uh, extraction and potential scenarios due to global climate change. We modeled this aquifer and considered the aquifer recharge reduction uh, due to the reduction of the rain and the sea water level rise, uh, the sea well, well, sea level um, rise. Uh, with this, we calculate that uh, Recife uh, will uh, lose this uh, resource in 30, 40 years, if in nothing. nothing is done. Next slide, please. Well, the delay, uh, next slide, please. In the, the delay of this perception of these problems, uh, hiders the proactive actions by the government and society. That is another problem. It's difficult for them to recognize this problem, even with uh, this type of study. Next slide, please. Uh, just to conclude, uh, it's urgent uh, to act to protect uh, this tomorrow's resource, the groundwater. We must recognize that the groundwater uh, protection action uh, um, has to start uh, 
with the most critical areas. It means that normally we don't have the governments in the countries and uh, we don't have many technical personnel that is almost impossible to study all the aquifer or restrict all the, the exploitation of all aquifer. It means that it's necessary to uh, localize, identify based on the studies, these critical areas involving in a more, in this area, in a more adequate mechanism for management and government. And, and, the mis that, uh, and uh, um, it's necessary to recognize that the command and control strategy is not good enough for the control of this water. Well, the example below uh, is a map of in Mexico, the government established regions uh, 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 or aquifers declared overexploited, then they uh, produce a list of restrictions. And uh, but you have another, uh, other some good other examples in Latin America, but this is still restrict. It means that normally the the, the law, the regulation, normally try to um, treat all the aquifer at the same level. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, pres uh, mentioned uh, previously, the lack of protection is due to the low perception of society, and Stephen mentioned the same thing. In this way, we must to bring visibility to, uh, to groundwater through studies, focus on the economic and social importance of the resource, showing the services and opportunities that this resource provides. And uh, we must uh, create training programs for all for all levels, for professionals, scholars, and uh, the government uh, also. And uh, last but not the least, we have to create mechanisms to involve uh, users in management, not just this uh, mechanism from the top to, to, to bottom, but the bottom to top mechanisms of management offering services a advantage to be legal people have to understand that it's much better to be legal uh, for um, their uh, well than to keep it that uh, clandestine or unknown uh, source the last slide please is just to say thank you for the opportunity and uh, i have a um, after that, so you can have a discussion and answer some questions. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for this uh, very good introduction to some of the key issues uh, that you're facing in, in Latin America when it comes to groundwater. Now we will move on to, uh, to India, where we will have Bas Alam, who will uh, talk about the importance of groundwater in India. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. So next 15 minutes, I'll talk about the importance of groundwater in India. Being a, such a varied audience from all over the globe, I'll try to give just an overview of what it means for India, what are the main issues, where we are, and hopefully at the end, uh, make you enough inquisitive enough to basically uh, reach out and for, for a more, uh, for, in, for for a discussion that can take place. Uh, next slide. So India being a large country, but also it is, India is the largest user of water, in the largest groundwater user in the world. So we abstract around 250 billion cubic meters of water. That's a lot of water to comprehend. And largely uh, uh, this water, 85% of this groundwater abstraction in India takes, for, takes place for agriculture, irrigating, uh, whereas 15% for domestic and industrial users. Uh, though 15% is less, but uh, I'll show in the coming slide how critical this 15% is uh, for the water security. And this water is abstracted through around 25 million groundwater pumps. Uh, it's 25 million is larger than the population of many countries, uh, you can say. And this, this number itself is one of the reasons why it is very difficult to regulate water use, uh, groundwater use in India. Given uh, the uh, magnitude of abstraction, its importance for agriculture, India being an agriculture uh, dominant country. Uh, estimates suggest that 10% of, of India's GDP or 70 to 80% of farm value output uh, comes from agriculture, uh, comes from groundwater irrigation. So that shows how important the groundwater is uh, for India's economy, India's food security, and also livelihood. Uh, next slide. 
but was it uh, always like this so the answer is no so at the time of independence what you see is that around 1947 groundwater contributed only 29% to the total irrigated area but in the decades that came after that specifically around 1960s and 1970s what you see this red dot is the groundwater irrigated area in india and that accelerated whereas the canal irrigated area which was a dominant one at the time of independence remained stagnated over the uh, over these uh, next decades and the reason was there were multiple reasons that went behind it uh, starting with that advent of modern drilling new pumps came up so that it becomes easy or cheaper to drill pumps but also the government policies uh, around uh, energy uh, subsidized energy so making it virtually literally uh, free to abstract water also a large electrification network what it means is that where the state state funded canal network stagnated this private boom in groundwater irrigations farmers drilling their own pumps accelerated like anything and at currently where, where we stand is that around 2/3 or 63% of the country's irrigated area uh, is provided by groundwater and mind you that it's not uh, the growth has not ended uh, it's still half of 50% of india's uh india's agriculture remains rain fed so uh, which is increasing so there would be more reliance more more groundwater irrigation that groundwater irrigated that will take place uh next slide other than agriculture uh, 15% 85% of the groundwater goes to agriculture with the 50% goes to domestic and industry and that 15% though a small part is very critical it provides 85 to 95 90% of the rural india water some water water domestic water requirements so you can say most of the rural india is dependent on groundwater whereas the estimates suggest that half of the urban india depends on groundwater for drinking water so you groundwater you can say from the bedrock of domestic water security in india but again then we have largely driven by the inadequate coverage of municipalities the inadequate coverage of pipe water supply which is a common theme i think across most of the global south and it's been challenged uh, this domestic water security has been challenged by depleting groundwater resources deterioration quality about which i'll come later uh, next slide so despite its importance i think ricardo and stefan has gone uh, has gone in detail detailing how important groundwater is for urban water security uh, and but the common theme is that even even here that groundwater being so important but remain it remains a blind spot in urban water planning and what we mean by urban uh, blind spot is that there is hardly any data easily accessible data or reliable data that tells us how much is the magnitude of groundwater use in in urban areas there is no record most of the wells are private wells that have been drilled by private individuals either because there was no coverage from municipality or there was inadequate coverage so 24/7 water supply nowhere no city uh, at least in india has it uh, so these pumps came up these private wells came up no record utility doesn't know about them so they go uh, so basically under the under the rug we don't know how much is being abstracted so those estimate i said like half of the urban india these comes from different studies uh, uh taking care of taking stock of through surveys or other 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 measures utility does supply uh, groundwater water through their wells and that's the only groundwater they account in their in their books so the all the private water that private groundwater that is abstracted goes uncovered unnoticed so recently as part of our, our iwa group on specialist group on groundwater management we provided a case studies of 10 cities in global south latin america sub saharan africa and india here's the link of the uh, pp uh, of the paper that came out uh, which goes for, uh, more into detail about each cities again uh, what the paper shows and what the study shows is that groundwater is very critical for urban water security but they there is hardly any reliable data so the, if that's a very uh, big gap that we need more stock taking of what's happening in the urban areas to regulate it more uh, next slide okay so now we have set the stage like groundwater being used in irrigation urban areas being so important but why it is so and the reason one of the reasons uh, is that especially in irrigation and also in domestic it provides the individual more control and more reliability in case of canal water or in case of pipe water you have to wait for someone to switch off a switch on a valve 
then the water flow through the pipe or canal and reaches you. Whereas if you have a well, what it needs is just to switch on a button, uh, switch, and the water flows out. So it has more control, more reliability. Then the other part is that it has high buffering capacity. What it means that it's much more resilient to short-term droughts. So if a drought comes, then surface water storage is generally go dry much sooner, whereas the day groundwater is at least alluvial aquifers, uh, which occupies a large part of India, remains resilient to the drought, short-term droughts. So, and then on the top of that, in India, we had policy incentives about energy subsidies uh, that made groundwater being a very, uh, being the go-to source to fulfill your water requirement. Uh, next slide. And then there are consequences of these acts. Uh, so what, what we have currently, uh, what you show in this figure, the red and the blue, red, yellow, and the orange are the areas where we are uh, past the limit of natural recharge. Basically what it means that we are abstracting much more groundwater than what rainfall or what is the natural recharge happening every year. But it means that the groundwater levels are going down. And in, in the future, it, they may go down so deep that if they are not accessible or they would be quality concerns. So around currently 20, 20 to 25% of the India's uh, land or administrative units are under these category. And what's uh, these numbers like research, uh, researchers have come out a critical in that says that unsustainable groundwater use is producing enough food, is producing food to feed 70, 173 million people in terms of calories, uh, food. Uh, so that's a dilemma. On this one side, we have non-sustainable groundwater abstraction. You wanna end it, make it sustainable. But at the same side, at the same time, this this water is producing food for large number of people. So it's about food security, also livelihood security of those farmers. Also, how to manage this? So they what it shows that they can't be a quick fix. We can't just focus on groundwater. It's a, it's a nexus that's out there. And there is a need to fix it because research also suggests that if we don't do anything. We just let it go. In future, because of groundwater running down, because of quality issues, our cropping intensity might reduce by 20%, whereas it might reduce by 68% in groundwater depleted regions. So again, if we don't do anything, then again, there's a food security issue, there's a livelihood issue, there's a farmer's income issue. So something has to be done in, in, in irrigation and agriculture. Whereas in cities, what you see is that these increasing events of water insecure cities. So after this Cape Town thing, if number of lists came out with these doomsday scenarios, so you will find number of Indian cities in that in that list. So the reason is increasing drought, inadequate coverage, increasing urban population means is that more and more cities supply demand is much more than supply. Groundwater is ever exploited, so it's it's a fix. So we have it's very critically important, but it's also very unregulated and needs proper management. Next slide. So this, I'll just, in the next few slides, I'll cover what are the, some of the pointers or some of the uh, leeways we have to manage it. And one part is this ground to energy nexus. And what we say is that in the middle or the left figure, you will see all those blue dots represent 1500 electric pumps where the red ones represent diesel pumps. So what you see in the Western and the Southern India, you have a lot of electric pumps. Whereas on the Eastern side, on the right side, you'll see a lot of red dots and diesel pumps. So this is the energy divide we have here. Uh, electric pumps, and this energy divides correlate with the right side plot you see where the water is over exploited. So all the places where we have a lot of electric pumps are the places where we have a lot of depletion happening. And the reason is most of these states, the energy is for irrigation is more or less free. So there is hard, there is very little incentive for proper irrigation uh, to water efficient agriculture, uh, then there are crop, there are some subsidies on high intensive cropping systems. So this gives us a way to manage it. If we can manage our energy better, maybe we can manage the groundwater better. So that's something, uh, the one scheme, next slide. The one scheme the government is trying to do is solar irrigation. And the one we heard about solar irrigation, we think our oh, cheap power, free power, farmers gonna pump more, but that's where the innovative part come in. So what the government and what we are trying to do is that these pumps are grid connected. What it means is that farmers can sell water, sell electricity. So they generate electricity. If they need to pump, they can draw electricity from the grid. But when they're not pumping, they have the they can sell it back. So it becomes the solar, solar irrigation becomes a source of income for a lot of these farmers. So they generate revenue from selling electricity. So that provides them an incentive to not pump more. 
and that has it's a it's a win win if it works well basically what it does is that it it incentivizes farmers to do more water efficient uh, uh, agriculture it can replace a lot of diesel pumps which are big carbon emitters so it's a mitigation strategy also whereas it also helps the utilities which are under the burden of tremendous subsidies uh, of billions of dollars going into billion dollars it removes these pumps from electric subsidies and put them into solar so it's a win win how does it work how doesn't it work it need to be seen but the government of india has launched this national scale big program number of indian states are already doing it imi international water management institute under our project we are evaluating the uh, solar irrigation impact in india but also in other south asian countries including pakistan nepal uh, and bangladesh i'd be glad to send you the further links about this i think that's a very interesting uh, development that is happening in this and now next slide next part is mar which is manage aquifer recharge artificial recharge of water india's focus on is is reflected through this uh, india's master recharge plan so india has identified at a national level about 1.1 million 1.1 million square kilometer of area for recharge about 185 billion cubic meters of water and to implement the program it's 18 billion usd dollars so these numbers reflect the magnitude of the program that india has and it though it remains a policy it's a plan but it reflects the intent of the government but other than national number of because water in india is a federal subject federal state subject number of states are already doing a lot of these policies and programs government pushing strongly through different scheme and names of on recharge part and that's again motivated 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 by the realization and the need that these resources the government resource is very critical and we need to manage it again i have to send for the links uh, on this thing next slide so in conclusion what we can say is that these numbers represent that government is very critical for india's economy food security and being india being an agriculture state uh, for livelihood security of farmers also because of this large reliance on groundwater that has led to very unsustainable groundwater extraction in large parts of india specifically western and southern part so now the, the, the number of schemes managing demand for supply are coming up specifically how to but the challenge remains how to manage this groundwater food energy nexus groundwater can't be managed alone it's linked to food security it links to energy part so how to manage it so the recent policies recent schemes are are good are, are a good step but the effectiveness 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 of the same remains to be seen and that's what we are also studying and i think coming 2 3 years would be critical on how what trajectory it takes in urban area groundwater is very critical but the data and the research shows that it actually remains invisible so there is a need for more for stock taking and holistic management of the same uh, next slide uh thank you and this is these are my ids you can uh, coordinates you can reach out to me I'm happy to take part in the discussion later thank you thank you very much fas um for that very interesting uh, introduction to india's groundwater use and spe especially the the different demands of the agriculture rural uh, versus domestic use and rural versus uh, um urban uh, demands I, i think that could uh, definitely generate some interesting uh, discussions in our conversation uh, later on in the moderated panel discussion um we will now move on to uh, julia gafu from uh, kenya who will uh, talk about the value of the uh, groundwater to africa uh, thank you tanya hi everybody um i'm going to be talking about the value of groundwater to africa with a focus mainly on kenya but of course with a lot of similarities to uh, the larger africa um next slide please so some of the key aspects that we're going to look at is um groundwater is a major source of drinking water in many parts of africa um and uh, you find that groundwater is highly dependent upon for domestic water supply uh rural livelihoods livestock rearing and agricultural practices in most of africa and we find that uh, a lot of uh, these rural uh, livelihoods uh, you know uh, the depend on uh, the presence of successful water wells equipped with reliable pumps which allow for the functioning of settlements uh, clinics schools and uh, livestock posts and we find that uh, there's a lot of private groundwater abstraction is uh, especially in urban areas which is uh, uh, has been increasing over the years um, becoming popular despite the high associated costs associated with drilling and equipping of boreholes 
And we also find that water utilities have a key role to play in managing this groundwater because uh, with increased uh, private groundwater abstraction, uh, the water utilities will come in to regulate that and uh, be able to uh, supply to uh, a greater, uh, greater use, more users. Next slide, please. So we find that uh, groundwater uh, for uh, rural livelihoods is really important because women do not have to walk for several kilometers uh, many hours a day in search of water. And because they can use this newly found extra time to earn a livelihood uh, you know, for their family because uh, uh, we find that uh, a lot of arid areas of the world and even in Kenya depend on entirely on groundwater like this uh, area of uh, uh, this is a, a picture of a, a, a semi-arid area in Kenya you know where they rely on uh, purely on groundwater for their supply next slide please so we also find that uh, some of these communities also rely a lot on cattle for their livelihood and you find that in some of these areas uh, there's a lot of conflict that uh, exists because of lack of ground of water and uh, supply of groundwater ensures that uh, pastoralist communities can coexist with uh, uh, other rural communities, reducing incidences of banditry attacks, over cattle rustling, and uh, water conflicts. Uh, next slide, please. So we also find that uh, groundwater is a means for uh, growing food, uh, because we find that, uh, for example, when we talk about Africa, um, we have uh, that we find that agricultural sector accounts for about 30% of the GDP, GDP in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, but we also find that, uh, you know, irrigation is a bit limited sometimes due to uh, implications associated with uh, groundwater exploration and construction costs and difficulties in financing. But we find that groundwater um, really comes in to mitigate against effects of prolonged drought that is common in many parts of arid and semi-arid uh, Africa. Next slide, please. So we also find that uh, groundwater is really important for uh, improved health for remote rural communities. You find that some of these marginalized uh, communities also require health access and uh, these facilities are not able to exist uh, without uh, water because the utilities are far off because these uh, communities uh, health centers are uh, remotely placed. Therefore, you find that groundwater helps in the running of these facilities and the rural communities are able to access uh, improved health, you know, uh, through the provision of groundwater. Next slide, please. So we also find that uh, we also have a lot of uh, um, marginalized uh, communities that uh, require access to education and education is only enhanced when we have accessibility to water. And uh, as I've said before, some of these areas, the only water that is accessible is groundwater. So you find that, for example, in a, a school for girls, they have a better management of menstrual hygiene because uh, these girls are able to access water and the uh, uh, incidences of uh, reduced school hours are, are mitigated against. And you also find that uh, perimenopausal women are also protected from social stigma when they have sufficient water for hygiene. Next slide, please. So we also find that uh, in urban areas that accessible groundwater means improved sanitation facilities for very urban dwellers. Uh, we know that some of these, most of very urban dwellers do not have access to sanitation facilities because of the way that they come up, because they are not really formal settlements and uh, utilities are not able to come in and provide uh, water supply in most of these cases because this, um, these uh, uh, settlements are really informal. Uh, so we find that the only source of water that they have is groundwater, uh, which really plays a big role in helping even improve sanitation facilities for urban dwellers because they're able to construct sustainable water sanitation facilities. Next slide. So we find that uh, you know there are a lot of stakeholders that have a, a key role to play in ensuring that uh, groundwater is accessible in many parts of Africa. For example, in Kenya, we find that uh, the government has allowed subsidies on solar equipment, which has made you know uh, boreholes uh, you know motorized, uh, which makes it even uh, we are able to get more groundwater because the motor motorized boreholes 
are able to serve a greater community as compared maybe to hand farms. And uh, we also find that the international donor organizations have continued to play a key role in funding for community projects because most of these communities will not be able to access uh, groundwater without uh, you know, external help. And we also find that uh, the increased penetration of private contractors has helped to lower the cost of drilling, for example, in Kenya, because uh, you find that there's a lot of uh, heightened uh, competition that uh, makes you know, cost to go lower. Uh, so that really helps more people uh, able to access you know, groundwater. And we also find that uh, manufacturers and suppliers of borehole pump equipment have also increased in recent years. Uh, which has played a big role in the sustainability of groundwater projects as spare parts are more readily available. Uh, next slide, please. So when you compare with other parts of uh, Africa, you find that uh, uh, some parts of Africa, the cost of constructing a water well is really high. For example, in East Africa, the cost of constructing a, a borehole is really high. You know, you find uh, like for example, in Kenya, you, uh, you have to spend at least 10,000 upwards to drill a borehole. And in other parts of Africa, you find that the cost of drilling uh, is really low because for example, in Nigeria, you find that uh, it's approximately 1500 USDs uh, to drill a borehole of about 150 meters. These are really big disparities. And, um, but they are also influenced by various factors, you know, like formation, you know, of, uh, uh, of, of the aquifers of uh, the boreholes, and you also find uh, that they are, the drilling technology is different in different parts of Africa. Um, you know, some are able to do with tube wells, and also depending on the government regulations for drilling of boreholes. And uh, you also find that associations play a big role in both regions in self-regulating the industry and weeding out irregular and professional contractors you know, in, for example, in both Nigeria and Kenya, there are uh, very active water, uh, water associations that uh, even come in and, uh, you know, help the government, you know, to weed out uh, the irregular and professional contractors, you know, and ensure that there's professionalism, you know, for example, in the drilling sector, which helps in the sustainability of uh, groundwater and avoids, you know, the wastage uh, that comes about with uh, you know um, irregular you know uh, and unprofessional contractors. Yes. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So you find that groundwater fills the gap in SDG six. Many African countries are still lagging behind in meeting the various targets of SDG six, uh, especially access to basic and safe drinking water. And groundwater is really the invisible resource needed in bridging this gap. So it's time to make the invisible visible. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, very interesting to hear how uh, how groundwater uh, presents a value to, to Africa, both in terms of rural livelihood, food security, but also health and even education. So, uh, so thank you very much for that insight. Now we will move on to our final panelists uh, from Denmark. Uh, a country that relies entirely on groundwater for its drinking water. So uh, please welcome uh, Troels Bjerg from VCS Denmark, who will talk about, about how uh, sustainable production of drinking water uh, can be achieved based on groundwater. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give a talk about sustainable uh, drinking water production based on clean groundwater in uh, Denmark. Next slide, please. But before I head on, it's important for me to stress that even though Denmark is indeed a part of Europe, the challenges we face in Denmark doesn't fully represent the challenges Europe is facing on a continental scale. Europe is a continent with very diverse climatic conditions and a continent facing a multitude of challenges due to climate change impacts unevenly distributed. Take a look at the expected future precipitation patterns, for instance. Northern Europe is getting wetter and Southern Europe is getting drier. With that in mind, I will zoom in on Denmark in the Northern part of Europe, where you see the black arrows, uh, where Denmark is located. Next slide, please. In Denmark, drinking water supply is based on 100% groundwater. That's quite unique, actually. The unique position is due to a humid climate with plenty of precipitation and a geological setting that makes groundwater easy accessible. In Denmark, we have no abstraction 
without permission through a concession system that has worked since 1926. It's very decentralized with uh, approximately 2,000 tons of water utilities. We have simple water treatment with aeration and sand filtration, nothing else. And we have a total drinking water production of uh, 400 million cubic meters per year. On a personal level, it's the water consumption is something like 100 liters per person per day. Next slide, please. In dealing with water quality issues, we have a national drinking water policy that states that production of drinking water should be based on clean groundwater with no advanced treatment, not even chlorination. Next slide, please. But it's not an easy thing to achieve in a country like Denmark, a country dominated by intensive agriculture, as you see on this uh, figure. In fact, we are very close to the world record with agriculture covering 60% of the total land area. Intensive agriculture is one of the major threats towards the quality of the shallow and quite vulnerable groundwater resources we have. The main issues we face considering groundwater quality are the use of pesticides and fertilizers in agriculture. Next, please. This map gives you an idea of the challenges we are facing. It's from our national monitoring program. It shows the concentration of pesticides in more than 6,000 abstraction wells monitored between 2016 and 2020. The blue and red dots is pesticides in abstraction wells below and above the drinking water standard, respectively. In 2020, pesticides were actually found in 51% of the monitored abstraction wells for drinking water production. Next slide, please. The National Monitoring Program shows there is an urgent need for groundwater protection. The solution we apply is a rather strict environmental regulation combined with targeted measures in areas with vulnerable groundwater resources of strategic importance. But how do we find the vulnerable areas where it's, it's, where it's necessary to apply targeted measures? Next, please. We do that through a quite unique national hydrogeological investigation of the groundwater resources that has been carried out since 1999. It covers approximately 40% of the country and the results are used by the municipalities in action plans for groundwater protection. The most important stakeholders in the action plans are the water utilities. And if action is needed, a major part of the action is taken by the water utilities. I'm from one of the water, these water utilities using the results from the National Hydrogeological Investigation as decision support in our effort to protect the ground resources on our well fields. Next slide, please. My water utility is called VCS Denmark. And just to give you an idea of the water utility I'm representing, here's a very brief introduction. Uh, I'm from the very first uh, water utility in Denmark, uh, founded in 1853. It's located in the city of Odense, uh, one of the largest water utilities in Denmark. We are responsible for production and distribution of drinking water from uh, mainly external protected well fields outside the city. We are responsible for disposal and treatment of wastewater, stormwater management, and we are a corporate utility company owned by the municipality, nonprofit, full cost recovery. So what's our main challenges when dealing with sustainable production of drinking water based on clean groundwater? Well, obviously we are also very concerned about groundwater groundwater pollution, or in other words, the quality of the product we deliver to our consumers. Groundwater protection is therefore a high priority. But sustainable production of drinking water is not just about the quality of the product you deliver. It's just as much a matter of the quality of the service you provide. And sustainability is indeed a part of the equation. Next slide, please. From our founding in 1853 until the 1980s, our main challenges were keeping up with the growing demand for drinking water caused by urbanization in our service area. Our answer to the growing demand wasn't sustainable. In some cases, the result was over-exploitation of the groundwater resources with deterioration of groundwater quality due to oxidization of the aquifers. Next slide, please. This is what an increasing demand looks like. It's our drinking water production from 1900 to 1988. The timeline stops in 1988 because 1988 was the year when it was decided to put a tax on drinking water in Denmark. So did it work? Next slide, please. Yes, it sure did. From the mid 80s until today, 
the drinking water production has been reduced by 50%, despite continued urbanization and population growth. growth. Why? Because the value of water is actually visible on the water bill. That's a path towards sustainable production of drinking water in Denmark. Next slide, please. Another important aspect of sustainable production is energy consumption. This is the energy intensity of our drinking water production today with numbers from 2021. As you can see, drinking water production based on clean groundwater is also very climate friendly. Remember, the greenest energy is the energy you don't use. As a comparison, desalination of seawater typically has an energy consumption of something like two to four kilowatt hours per cubic meters. In this case, we are at 0.3 kilowatt hours per cubic meters. Next slide, please. In other words, well, using less is more sustainable. And I'm both talking about consumption of water and energy. Next slide, please. Okay, we are on the right track when it comes to consumption of water and energy, but what about the water quality issues? Well, we indeed have water quality issues. This figure shows pesticides in our abstraction wells. In 27 of our abstraction wells, we are above the drinking water standard in BCS Denmark. We are indeed challenged on our ambition on producing drinking water based on clean groundwater. Next slide, please. We know a quick fix uh, isn't uh, possible. That's the harsh reality of groundwater management. Instead, we are aiming for drinking water based on clean groundwater in 2050. Our success on the path towards 2050 depends on our willingness to take action. Next slide, please. This is a quick overview of our actions taken. We prioritize well field management to secure an up-to-date abstraction infrastructure. We aim for sustainable groundwater abstraction to minimize long-term negative impacts on groundwater quality. We look for alternative resources to minimize the pressure on our well fields. We implement a preliminary advanced water treatment where necessary. And finally, we protect the groundwater on our well fields to secure water quality on the long term. Next, please. And these are some of the measures we apply in BCS Denmark in our effort to protect the groundwater from pesticide pollution in areas with vulnerable groundwater resources of strategic importance. Joint financing of state, municipal, and private funded afforestation agricultural land use agreements, plugging of old and unused wells, public awareness campaigns, to just to give you an example of one of the, of the measures. What I will focus on in the rest of my presentation is afforestation since it's our top priority. Next, please. And why afforestation? Well, because afforestation is also a top priority on a national scale due to the National Forest Program, where one of the key objectives is to increase the forest cover to 20 to 25 percent by the end of the century. Today, the forest cover of Denmark is only 13 percent. Adding to that, forest has been protected through national forest regulations since 1805. Forests in Denmark are, with a few exceptions, permanent. And when we co-finance afforestation, use of pesticides and fertilizers are banned permanently. But for also, for forests also have a lot of benefits besides groundwater protection production of wood, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, recreation and public health, energy from biomass, and so forth. A few words about mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions by carbon sequestration. One square kilometer of young deciduous forest in Denmark accumulates approximately 1,000 tons of carbon dioxide every year. That's actually a lot compared to the carbon footprint of our drinking water production. Next, please. This is one of our larger afforestation projects, the Brüller Water Forest, uh, just to give you an example. The purpose of the afforestation project is protection of one of our most important well fields. Uh, we have done it in a partnership with a private partner, Hilsenskabet. We have done it through acquisition of farmland through land consolidation. And we have contributed with 60% of the acquisition costs. And uh, the private company is responsible for afforestation operation and maintenance of the forest. Next, please. This is the well field um, before afforestation. The blue dots is the abstraction wells. There are four in this case. And this is what the landscape looked like in 2014. The white areas on the map are intensive agriculture. As you can see, it's all white. If you go one step back, you can see a map where everything is white. 
And here you can see a map uh, where everything is green. The green shaded areas are the forests on the well field. And at present, we are working on expanding the protected areas through land and use agreements with local farmers and acquisition of, uh, just one step back, please. Thank you. In cooperation with our private partner, we have uh, bought 150 hectares of land for afforestation, the green areas. And at present, we are working on expanding the protected areas through land use agreements with the local farmers and acquisition of land for afforestation with our private partner. Next, please. Obviously, afforestation doesn't make sense everywhere. It depends on the context. Consider our afforestation an example of a low-tech nature-based solution. I'm not saying that technology isn't a part of the solution when we are dealing with water quality issues. It is. And in some cases, we might even use the most advanced we can find as long as it is necessary. But if we only aim for the technological fix, we might end up with suboptimal solutions. The choices we make, the solutions we apply need to fit the big picture with sustainability challenges we are facing as a water utility on a local and global scale. That calls for a systemic fix. Next, please. With that in mind, I will wrap up my presentation with a picture from a, a rainy day with a lot of groundwater recharge in one of our afforestation projects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul, for providing a water utilities perspective on how we can achieve sustainable groundwater uh, management in both short term and, and long term. Uh, now we've reached the time for the Q&A discussion, so we would like to uh, invite all the panelists to turn on your camera and join us for this moderated discussion, and it will be Doris Gram from Denmark who will be the moderator. Yes, uh, thank you everyone for a very interesting perspective from all, uh, all around the world. Uh, being from Denmark, uh, uh, I know uh, all about the situation trolls uh, presented but i wasn't aware that that uh, uh, that we also had uh, an important issue of uh, gender equality uh, hence in your uh, african uh, uh, presentation julia uh, that was very interesting along with uh, all the other um, presentations but that was a new perspective for me and maybe it shouldn't be but that was it um, I would start with um, with a with a question from the from the Q and A session that is very um, general and it is for all of you and so if yeah, I just put the question out there and ask you to reflect uh, on it, it's uh, from Elisa Donovan who says, in your opinion, what are the main competences, technical and or other future hydro hydrogeologists or water managers should acquire? to uh, promote more sustainable use of groundwater. So this is a question about how do we step into the future? How do we get more sustainable use of groundwater? What would be the most important issues? Stephen, if you, uh, if you would start, please. Yes, daughter, perhaps I should kick off there. Well, I think that, um, you know, our understanding, uh, professional hydrologists now have, a, in general, pretty good understanding. We still need more monitoring um, to improve our level of certainty and in inter interpreting certain, certain factors. But we are um, you know, a lot stronger than we were 10 or 15 years ago. But where we have greatest difficulty is in communication and communication within the water sector to other stakeholders. Um, I would say that the level of understanding of groundwater management, the need for groundwater, groundwater management, remains rather poor in general across the water sector and across the even the water management sector. And this um, area of improved communication is perhaps our biggest challenge. Uh, I, we don't, you know, there, there, there have been, I had two or three examples in my presentation of cases where it was overcome, um, but it's not easy, even in the developed uh, countries of Europe, for example, to have a good understanding of groundwater management needs across uh, the water sector and across the water regulatory sector in general. 
And also, it's also difficult to promote a major involvement in management from the water utilities. It's easier in places like Germany and Denmark, where they are nonprofit making organizations um, that are uh, cl more closely related to local government. But certainly in, in, in the UK, uh, this also remains a challenge. Uh, so I think our, our, our biggest uh, efforts have to go in putting our points across within the water sector. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Uh... What is would you uh, what would you your take be, uh, Ricardo, on this? Uh, the main competences future hydrologists or water managers should uh, acquire to promote sustainable use of groundwater. Stephen mentioned. Yeah, I think that uh, Stephen. Oh, sorry, I yeah. think that's the point. Uh, the main issues in terms of groundwater uh, that uh, is an uh, invisible resource for many aspects. Uh, I, I like to use the expression that the groundwater is, is invisible for official statistics. When you see all the official statistics about the water supply in the private or even in public uh, uh, system in, in all country in my region, but that's in the rest of uh, uh, developing countries, and that is normally you don't see groundwater. You see sometimes water, and but the groundwater is just uh, uh, below this, the, 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 under the radar of the, the perception of it, not just the society, but the, also from the government. It means that people also is, are not prepared for the, from the government side, are not prepared to think about the, the groundwater and think about the, that the groundwater is also a, a, a very good solution. Normally, for example, in cities, uh, we can see that the engineering or the responsible for the facility say, okay, I, I can supply this neighborhood or this part of city using uh, groundwater, but in the future, our dreaming is to have surface water to get more reliable water. It means reliable, but it's also because they believe that it's more reliable than groundwater. It means that the invisibility of the groundwater is in all, all aspects. And I, I think that one necessary uh, uh, movement from the sector is to get more visibility to do that. And also, I think it's, it's a very uh, intelligent expression that for today, that is. Uh, the invisible, invisible, visible. That's the idea for the for the whole planet. Thank you. So you're also on the communication line. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Sure. Julia, how does it uh, play out from your perspective? Uh, from uh, my perspective, uh, professionalism is very important for the sustainability of the water sector. Uh, you find, for example, in, uh, uh, let me just use Kenya as an example. You find that uh, a lot of people who are in, you know, uh, the water industry, except for hydrogeologists, you find that uh, many of them do not have like formal training. Let me say like in groundwater. Let me talk about the drilling sector, for example. You find that a lot of people who actually practice in the drilling sector do not have any formal training. And that really um, influences how, you know, for example, water wells are drilled because you find that the lack of uh, professionalism sometimes um, affects the quality of water wells that are drilled because really depends on which school of thought you're coming from. So I believe that technical uh, tr training is important. There is no uh, one technical training that is really better than the other, but I think you know, being able to get some technical training is really important because it helps improve the professionalism in the water sector. Because without that, then we find that uh, everybody comes in and wants to do you know, uh, things their way somehow, <laughs> you know. But there's need to regulate the sector and so that we can have more sustainability. So professionalism is really important. Thank you. Uh, technical training, regulations, 
and communications. Faiz, uh, what is your take from India? I, uh, I noticed that you uh, advocated for more data, but you did have a lot of data on uh, over-exploitation. So, so where are you on the road to sustainability? I think we will always want more data. I think data. Yeah. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but I think one point I uh, I'll take is just understand the nexus uh, part. Uh, that it's more and more important to realize that uh, groundwater can't be managed alone, uh, without looking at how it links to social part, how it links to food, how it links to energy. Uh, so though we need uh, uh, the, with the technical competence, I think there's a need to realize. Uh, to manage groundwater, you need to manage other sectors and how the groundwater links to other sectors will play a key role uh, for future sustainable management of groundwater and of, of the overall water sector. I think that's the point I will add other than what uh, others have already uh, said. Yes, thank you. Uh, good points. Uh, Trolls, if you could uh, wrap that up, what is uh, the most important uh, road to sustainability in your opinion? Well, generally speaking, in Denmark, I think we have a good understanding of the importance of groundwater and that as a resource we need to manage sustainable. Uh, but anyway, it's a good question about the main competences needed in the future for sustainable groundwater management. But I don't think there's one answer to that question. It's so much dependent on the on the context. So what might be the right solution in Denmark will definitely not be right everywhere. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a con it's context dependent. Uh, I think and the and then maybe again, I will mention the systemic effects I was talking about in my presentation. If, if we are going to find the right solutions uh, for the challenges we are facing when it comes to sustainable groundwater management, that's uh, the holistic approach that uh, we, we need. Uh, and uh, and uh, as you can see, just on a continental scale in Europe, there are different challenges, whether you are in Northern Europe or Southern Europe. And when you look at it at a global scale, uh, the diversity is even bigger. So there's there's not one size there's not a one size fits all on the, on the, in this case. Uh, also, mm -hmm. could I just come in again there? Yes, of um, course. Just to uh, because I think it's, it will be a broader interest to contrast the Danish approach um, with the British approach to controlling diffuse agricultural pollution, um, and. The reaction was different primarily because of the difference of the attitude of the water utilities. The water utilities in, in, in Denmark embraced the idea of minimal treatment of, of, of groundwater in general, but not universally. The ones in the UK did not. And they saw it as an opportunity to, to invest in treatment technology uh, and let the farmers get on with uh, whatever they liked. Uh, there were exceptions, and we do have some areas of good practice and minimal treatment and land use control, but not nearly as much uh, as in Denmark. Uh, and I think it, the contrast between the, those, those two and the way in which the role of the utilities affected the outcome is very interesting. I agree. Uh, I would like actually to, how is the... How is the water quality when the, with the treatment technology uh, all going on? That that uh, that must be very expensive water compared to. Exactly, to, but we had yeah. we had a privatized but regulated water industry, which was allowed to treat if it if by immediate action it could not solve the problem in another way, and so <laughs> in the space of about um, uh, one decade. It spent, uh, you know, about a thousand million euros on treatment technology instead of dealing and addressing the land use issues. Not all water utilities, but many of them took took that route in the UK because they were allowed to, and they passed the cost on to the customer and became more competent in water treatment. But they didn't get involved in water man in, in land in land use management. And I think this is a an important. Uh, point of the discussion within the European equation. Because so I suspect that the only countries in Europe that have adopted this sort of approach that Trolls uh, described are, are some of the German lender, some of the German uh, cities and Denmark, but more generally, uh, it's gone the way 
that the, uh, the British utilities went, which I don't think is the correct way. Interesting. Um, with that in mind, I would like to dwell a little bit on the financing uh, part of, of, of groundwater management. I, don't, I, don't, I know that you didn't mention that so very much, but uh, I'm also a member of the Euro organization that's uh, on the drinking water committee in the European Water uh, Association. And one of the main issues uh, we are discussing along with a lot of other stuff is that uh, how do we get the money to do this. And one of the issues are the, the profit, non-profit uh, discussion. So, so if you would um, reflect uh, a moment on how important is it or, or what is the incentive uh, to move forward with the groundwater use uh, and how uh, would it be possible to finance these uh, all these uh, data and uh, all other uh, necessary measurements that you are uh, uh, aiming for. Uh, if you would uh, maybe have a take on that, uh, Faiz, because uh, I noticed that you had uh, something about uh, money and the uh, food energy nexus in your presentation. So maybe you had some thoughts on that. On the money part, I think uh, take, I'll talk about the agriculture part. I think in the utilities in India, uh, remains financially crunch. I think Stephen has much more uh, expertise in that area also, given his uh, vast work. So agriculture indirectly, we are putting billions of dollars in terms of subsidies when we provide these energy subsidies going into these uh, pumping, uh, pumping pumps. Uh, so the one way uh, the idea is uh, there's already so much money going in, going in indirectly. How how we can shift that money out? or how we can basically put that money in, uh, in, in proper incentives uh, to do so uh, in proper incentives. That remains a key. So the example I provided about solar solar uh, solar pumping, where the plan is a national level scheme, the government will be providing a lot of uh, uh, part subsidies for to these farmers to shift uh, uh, to these solar irrigations. So what it does, uh, I said innovative, what it does is that it, when, when, when a pump converts from an electric or diesel uh, to a solar one, what goes away with is the subsidies that are going into electricity one, electricity subsidies in the future, diesel import uh, bill that goes with it. So that's, I think what we need is an innovative ways uh, to, to get that money out uh, from one part to the other one. And solar is provides one way. On the other side, when it comes to uh, supply, like making recharge structures and all, what we already have in India is large number of government programs that do implement solutions in the field. For example, we have Narega. And Narega is the largest employment program in the world. It spends, I think, north of 10, 20 billion dollars every year uh, to provide employment and large in terms of rural work. And most of these rural works are water works, natural resource management works. So the government has been working how to make these billions of dollars being spent in Narega schemes and other schemes indirectly to support, provide employment in rural areas for better groundwater management. So that remains. So it's all about how we can converge, how we can innovate in terms of financing. And these two, so these two examples, I think, provide a way, a way ahead in terms of getting money. Thank you. Of course, uh, there needs to be jobs to be done. The incentive structure is very important. So thank you for that, uh, Faiz. Uh, Julia, do you have uh, some thoughts about the financing part of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the African uh, sustainability and groundwater issues? Yes, I think even in Africa, the government subsidies really help. Uh, I give an example of Kenya, whereby we have uh, uh, government subsidies on solar installations because the solar panels are subsidized. And I think really that comes into uh, like really help, uh, you know, more communities have, you know, solarized boreholes because that ensures that they can be able to draw out more water and have more uh, water for more uses. Uh, we also find that maybe because of the devolution factor, maybe like in our country, some county governments also engage in uh, drilling of uh, boreholes. 
And uh, we also find that in some cases whereby utilities are not able to take pipe systems, they also invest in the groundwater, you know, they use groundwater as a means of supplying water, you know, to areas where uh, the regular pipe system cannot reach. So the government really does play a lot of uh, a big role in financing, but we also find that uh, there's also uh, quite some financing also from international uh, NGOs uh that come in to also facilitate especially in rural rural uh water systems uh, rural water systems it's usually mostly um ngos and international non-government organizations that really come in to uh, do that finances that financing yeah yes interesting uh, actually, I found it so interesting. I I can't remember. Did I ask for your take on on this uh, with the financing, uh, uh, Ricardo? Uh, I'm sorry. I did you answer uh, about financing? Uh, you didn't, did you? Uh, no, I actually I can speak a little bit about my country that uh, we don't have from the government any uh, financial incentive for use of the groundwater. It means that 90% uh, of the use of groundwater in my country is, for, uh, is provided by private uh, owner wells. And, um, and uh, normally it, it's occur or they use it than using the, 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 the own money to do that. And that actually is because they, they, they face one or two problems uh, in the decision to use the groundwater privately is because of, or the system, the public system is not good enough for provide the water or the cost of the water is cheaper than the, the regular public water. As I mentioned, the city of Recife, the, uh, we have uh, the increase the price of the groundwater, the extraction, because of the, the reduction of the potential metric level in twice, it means that uh, they pay twice more the cost of the water, but it's still is a half price of the public water. It means that the people continue using because of this, it, except uh, when I speak about the, the government or some incentive to use the water, except in areas of semi-arid or very poor areas in the northeast of the country, that uh, uh, we have problems of uh, water supply and the water security for the population. In these cases, uh, the government has a very large program that provide wells, drilling wells, or sometimes the water is, is too saline that they also need to provide the desalinization plants. That is small desalinization plants and uh, it's uh, coordinated by local uh, people. Of course, the, the government provides the system and the people, local people in cooperative uh, try to manage the system. That is a very successful experience, but is very localized in areas like this that uh, we have some problems of water security. But in general, I speak about the private money for groundwater and also uh, not many incentive from the government, even in studies. Thank you. Uh, so what, just to wrap up your presentation, what would you consider the most important change necessary in your country? Because compared to the other presentations, you have, a, um, or maybe it's just because it wasn't in a presentation, but I, uh, I, I fear that the incentives to be sustainable and groundwater management are not uh, really present uh, at, at, uh, at the moment. So what would you consider the most important change necessary from your uh, point of view in, in, uh, in Latin America? Uh, well, uh, we can speak about uh, many uh, actions and depend on the situation, depend on the country and uh, how much uh, water is available for the public water supply or private water supply or even for the agricultural activities. Normally uh, in, in Brazil, except for this area in the Northeast, you are speaking about a very uh, wet country that is, we have a, a lot of uh, water in terms of rain a lot and then can keep, for example, the agricultural uh, land uh, 
uh, using this, this just the, the, the rainwater to keep the production. In some parts that now are facing problems of, um, of um, uh, drought more frequently, uh, big farmers are going to, to groundwater to try to do that. That's, that's uh, uh, one aspect of the, the country. It means that the motivation for the society to, to implement programs for, for more, uh, more sustainable programs for groundwater is to very limited. But it's interesting that the country has, for example, in our state, in for more industrialized areas, you have a very good programs for control of the groundwater contamination. It's interesting because we have much more hydrogeologists working or engineering working on quality and remediation of the aquifer than to provide water for the population. Because as we have a very high technology uh, uh, in, in place here, for example, in some states like more industrialized states and, uh, and uh, also the regulation is much more followed than for the uh, water in general in terms of a water supply. That's that's thank what. Uh, thank, thank you, Ricardo. We I think maybe we have enough uh, material for yet another webinar on this. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your very passionate uh, presentations, all of you. Um, I would uh, just remind you that there are some uh, uh, questions for the presenters in the Q and A box, and I will uh, answer some of them. That I, there's a and uh, if the panelists would be so kind to answer the ones directed directly to you, it would be very nice. And I'll pass the floor uh, on to the next presenter. Thank you very much for participating in this. And thank you very much for letting us see how diverse this uh, groundwater management is. Thank you, Jordi. And thank you all the, to all the panelists who said everything I was going to say. So I think we should just move on to, to the next. and. Uh, segment, which is uh, the Congress president for the World Water Congress and Exhibition uh, 2022, which will take place in Copenhagen, uh, Anna Specko. Uh, if we could get you, you're already there on camera. We just need to get the uh, presentation ready. Yes, hello. <clears throat> hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to speak to you from Denmark on World Water Day. Congratulations to all of us on World Water Day. I'm the Congress President for IWA World Water Congress and Exhibition in, in September this year in Copenhagen. Initially, I would like to set one scene for groundwater protection. I would like to, to set one scene for groundwater protection. It's a simple calculation. Some of you may think it's too simple, but anyway, you heard trolls talk about uh, agriculture in Denmark, 60% of the area was cultivated. And in my country, we produce approximately uh, half a billion cubic meter drinking water per year to, for, for drinking purposes and for industry. And the quality standard for each pesticide in drinking water, you know that is set by the EU is 0.1 microgram per liter, which means that if we dissolve 50 kilograms, 50 kilograms active substance pesticides to the total production, we have reached the quality standard of 0.1 microgram per liter. The consumption of pesticides in Danish agriculture is approx 300,000 kilogram per year, which means that we must believe, we must believe that 99 0.9% of the pesticides disappear with the crops in adsorption, in absorption, in chemical and biological processes, oil and flow, etc., before it reaches the aquifers. If we want to secure clean groundwater for future generations. I think that's uh, something you could reflect on that uh, we have it is not easy to combine intensive agriculture with catchment for groundwater abstraction. Next slide, please. Okay, in fact, I just wanted to tell you how much we are looking forward to seeing and meeting you 
in Copenhagen in September in this brief presentation. I think, I think we all miss to meet physically. Meetings like this on, on Zoom or Teams are very interesting, but imagine to meet again in 3D. Next slide, please. In Copenhagen, in Copenhagen, groundwater is a special focus area, and that is something new in the IWA context. And realized due to the growing importance of groundwater in the global water supply. Next, please. The UN agenda for sustainable development, the SDGs, are overarching the six Congress themes and the high level summit. Remember, we have only eight years now to go to reach the goals. Eight years, friends. You will primarily find the groundwater topics in theme three and six. Next, please. At the Congress, we intend to discuss various very important agendas for water, wastewater and climate change, from the most advanced water technologies to basic wash. Next, please. But as mentioned, groundwater is a special focus area. And on Monday, the first Congress day, we have a groundwater forum, a full day. Among other international capacities within groundwater, you will have the opportunity to meet Dr. Stephen Forster and Julia Gaffu again. Next, please. The white. Before the Congress in Denmark, through the organization State of Green, uh, State of Green has released the white paper groundwater based water supply. You have already or will soon get a link to this publication. Next, please. The white paper covers an introduction and inspiration to all aspects within groundwater based water supply. Next, please. In Copenhagen, you can really cultivate your interest in groundwater. Participate in the forum, join special presentations, as I said, especially in theme three and six, look at suppliers and consultants exhibitions and join a technical tour and experience groundwater based water supply live. Next please. Before my before ending my presentation, I want to state something important to reflect on. And I'll read it. Groundwater flow is so slow that even specialists have difficulties in fully comprehending the time span of the entire cycle. The slow flow has positive and negative effects. On the one hand, groundwater undergoes a very efficient purification process through natural filtration in the unsaturated zone and in the subsoil from the time that it falls as rain until it ends up in the aquifers. On the other hand, if groundwater is polluted, it takes years or even decades to remedy as pollution usually originates in more or less distant sims of the past. Effects of the implementation of today's groundwater protection measures will not be immediately accessible perhaps not even in our lifetime. Nonetheless, the objective of securing clean groundwater for future generations demands action now. The recognition of this fact requires highly enthusiastic specialists and brave politicians. That's my opinion. And you can, you can discuss that, of course. Uh, next, please. Dear friends and colleagues, we have a special responsibility besides innovating and implementing advanced technology and solution. The most serious water problem has not been solved yet. And we have a substantial responsibility to do more. Next, please. So, The Super Early Bird rates are available until the 15th of May. Please make use of that. You will get uh, access to the Congress much cheaper. The registration is open now. Next, please. 
and uh, join us in Copenhagen. We can hardly wait to welcome you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, and yes, we do hope to see you in Copenhagen in September uh, for the World Water Congress and exhibition. Can you, yes. Uh, I promise to deliver some messages here at the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for, for staying uh, along with us all the way. Um, we have some, IWA has some upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one is on water safety planning, tools for development and implementation, and it will take place on April 7th. Uh, you can sign up uh, via IWA's um, web page. Um, if you wish to join uh, the IWA network of uh, water professionals and you're not yet a member, you can use this discount uh, code, which uh, will give you 20% discount off new uh, membership if you join before December 31st this year. To all the panelists for uh, uh, joining us today and sharing your uh, experience with uh, sustainable groundwater management in your region. Uh, thank you to all the attendees for attending. Uh, and as you can see in the chat, um, we will uh, you will receive uh, the webinar slides and the video recording and a Q and A report, uh, also with the uh, answers to some of the questions that we unfortunately didn't have time to cover during the Q and A session today. So uh, look for that in your mailbox and have a continuous uh, happy World Water Day. Thank you. <laughs>